Today, we help your photos take flight on Behind the Shot. Hi, I'm Steve Brazel, and this is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. And there's one type of photography that I don't think I've ever really had on the show until today, and I've got a very special guest for you. Before we get into the guest, just a little housekeeping. First of all, recently we've had a number of reviews on iTunes, and to those of you that are leaving both star ratings and reviews, I just want to personally say thank you to you. It helps with discoverability, but more importantly, it just helps me know that you guys like what I'm doing here, and that's really the main reason that I do it is to try and help you guys get some information. So to everybody that's done that, thank you. Also, one last thing, you'll see this new printer here behind me because I've had people comment that I had the Canon Pro 100 behind me. Canon sent me a Pro 1000 to test and kind of compare with the Pro 100. So watch for that because we got an episode on that coming up soon. So that brings me to my guest. Now, before I bring the guest on, and I don't know if, if he's ever heard me tell this, but here was my first introduction to today's guest and the reason, and you'll see it when you read the blog post at BehindTheShot.tv that goes with this episode, the reason the blog post starts like it was. My first introduction to podcasting, I'm an old school network engineer. I was an MCSE on NT351. For those of you that are geeks, you'll know what that means. And I've always listened to Leo Laporte's podcast network, MacBreak Weekly, This Week in Photo, et cetera. And years and years ago, one of the original voices on MacBreak Weekly was my guest today. And at the time, I heard them mention, oh, he does photography. It never clicked, right? Years later, Steve gets into photography and hears the name again. And I'm thinking, could Scott Bourne be the same Scott Bourne from MacBreak Weekly? And he is Scott Bourne. I am honored to have you on. Thank you for having me, Steve. I'm glad to be here. It, you know, it, it's it's one of those interesting just kind of circles, right? Where you you learn about somebody in, in a genre that you may not think about, in this particular case, tech, and then you come around to knowing them or being friends with them as we are later. I'm honored to have you on. For those people who have have uh, you know been under a rock and don't know Scott Bourne, because again, you've done so many podcasts and everything else. Let's start with your photography history. How do you describe what you photograph to people when they find out that you're a photographer? Well, I appreciate the introduction. I'm a bird and wildlife photographer with an extraordinarily heavy emphasis on bird. About 90% of what I do is bird photography. That's where I've spent the last 15 years. But I got my start as an auto racing photographer because I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I had the good fortune to have a half-sister who was married to the sports editor of the Bloomington Herald Tribune, the second largest newspaper in Indiana. They got a press pass to cover the Indy 500. I think I was 17. They didn't have any money to send anybody. So they said, Scott, you like cameras. You want to go? And I said, what the heck? I went. <laughs> had no idea what I was doing. And that turns out they had an all access pass, the best kind of pass you can have an over the wall. Wait a minute. Pass. You had all access media pass to the <laughs> Indianapolis 500 at 17. Yeah. I had no clue what I had in my hand, but everyone noticed because back then it was a gold lapel pin. It wasn't the big kind of, you know, credentials everybody wears today. Right. right. And yeah, I'm walking through pit road and I'm kind of, you know, jazzed because I've been to the race many times. I grew up there, but I'd never gotten to go back behind the scenes, so to speak. And the guys from Nikon yell at me, hey, come over here. Because <laughs> I was carrying the camera I owned, which was a Nikon FTN with a 50 millimeter lens. <laughs> That's wow. what I brought to photograph the Indy 500. <laughs> Did you get what anything I that you liked with it? Oh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I never used it actually. Um, so the guys from Nikon, as they do at all major sporting events, they loan gear to pros at the event. So you show up. I mean, I know a lot of guys that shoot for Canon, for instance, that don't even bring a camera to the events. They just grab one from the Canon press pool and they shoot it and then they hand it back in. But yeah, they saw, they saw I was carrying a Nikon. He goes, you're a Nikon shooter? I said, yeah, we got this brand new camera called the Nikon F1. Would you like to try it? I said, sure. 
And they said, and it's got this real sophisticated thing called a motor drive. And I'm like, what's that? And, and here's our new 200 F4 lens. By the way, back then, the 200 F4 lens on any camera sucked so bad that it couldn't suck enough. But it was, you know, that was the state of the art then. So they said, yeah, use that. So I stick my other little camera in the bag. I've got this badass new F1 with the motor drive. I press the button. It goes, ka-ch, ka-ch, ka-ch. I'm just like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. And then I walk down and another guy stops me. He goes, hey, you got a gold pin. Who are you shooting for? I said, Bloomington Herald Tribune. He said, you want a string for AP? Now, mind you, <laughs> Oh I had God. no I I had no idea what the word string meant, nor did I know who AP was. <laughs> I was a dumb 17-year-old kid. So I said, sure, because I've learned early in my life to just say yes to pretty much everything right. and, and it'll work out. So he puts a big black armband on my right arm, hands me a giant bag with about 200 rolls of Triax. Now, this is good because guess what Scott brought? Two rolls of Triax. <laughs> I had two rolls with me. <laughs> Because that's all I could afford. I was 17. And so I got 200 rolls of Triax, and he gives me another black bag with a number on it. He goes, that's your number. What will happen is you shoot and you fill this other bag with the expired film. We'll have a guy come by and pick that bag up three or four times during the, during the race, give you another bag. And if anything that you shoot gets published, we'll pay you. And I'm like, cool. Well, Okay, so <laughs> that's quite different from how things work today. Oh, I know. And with know. your racing background, your 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 motorsports photography background, you end up transitioning into avian photography. And you have since been published in over and if if my numbers are wrong, correct me, but the bottom line is the numbers are insanely off the chart. You've been published in over 200 publications, and here's the the thing in researching you, as long as I've known you, I still did some research on you. Huffington Post called you one of the 30 most influential photographers on the web. Amazing. And you're still podcasting. Your your current podcast is called? PictureMethods.com. Okay, so PictureMethods.com. And I was honored to be, as, as Scott has just launched this podcast, go check out episode number three, which I am on. And by the time this show goes live, you will be up to episode number five, uh, but again, long history in podcasting. And let's talk a little bit about where else this has led you. You are an Olympus visionary and you shoot Olympus camera and gear. Yeah, more than two and a half years exclusively, Steve. And the stuff you get, see, and this is part of the thing that I find fascinating about photography just kind of in general, right? We're all, we, we all tend to be um, tribalistic on our gear, <laughs> oh, I'm a Canon shooter. Oh, I'm a Nikon shooter. And then there's that old saying, the best camera is the one that you have with you. And I, I like that phrase, not because it's even so much true, although it is, but because it reminds people that the fact that there's two big name brands or three big name brands does not mean that there are not other camera brands out there that may be even better suited for you. Right. I mean, I know a lot of people who don't shoot the major brands and what you capture with Olympus is literally nothing short of beautiful. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. I had no choice, really, uh, Steve. I've had 11 shoulder surgeries on my right shoulder. And on the 11th one, my orthopedic surgeon said, Scott, I'm the best orthopedic surgeon in the world. Just ask me. And <laughs> he said, I can't I can't fix it. He said, you got nothing left to work with. So you need to stop taking pictures this minute and if you don't you'll probably be crippled and in a wheelchair the whole right side of your body will be worthless because that shoulder can take you all the way down and i was just i was pretty distraught to be honest with you i'm like what do you mean there's i'm i suck in general as a human being and at everything except when it comes to photography that's the one place i find myself to be acceptable and can stand my own company and i didn't know you know how am i going to proceed well that day olympus announced the omd em1 mark ii with tracking autofocus now, I had used a, a lot of Olympus cameras on and off. In fact, Rich Harrington and I did a lynda.com uh, title on Which how Which was going to be one of my points, that you, you've you done a lot of Lynda stuff. And before that, I shot Olympus in the film days. You know, here's why. The OMD system in film, I left out of the Nikon system to the Olympus because it was the first one with a match needle exposure meter. And I thought that was really cool. So then I ended up leaving that for Canon because of autofocus. I stayed with Canon a long time, flirted with Nikon some, went back to Canon. 
I shot it with Canon right up to the end when, you know, I had the shoulder surgery and I said, well, I'm going to try this new camera. It's smaller and lighter. I'll see if it'll work. I went and bought the camera with my own money. Now, by the way, the popular meme is that, you know, Olympus paid me to switch. And that's why I say nice things about Olympus. Oh, do I wish that were true? I'm sorry about the order of this events. I'm sad about it because it meant money out of my pocket, but I bought this stuff. And then they made me a visionary. I wish it had been the other way around. But I went to California on my own dot shot with it and thought, wow, this actually works. And so I, at that time, Steve, had six 1DX Mark IIs. And I had the 800, the 600, the 500, right. 400, the 300, the, all the primes. I had $110,000 worth of, of uh, Canon gear when I bought my Olympus stuff. I sold the 800 and the 600 and paid for everything Olympus had that I wanted. <laughs> then I sold the rest of it and bought a Jaguar, but that's a different story. Well, anyway. <laughs> and, and we have a mutual friend that also shoots Olympus, and that's Andy Anatko. I've uh -huh. had Andy on the show before talking about, now when Andy was on, we were more talking about, you know, the tech side of it and, and the state of mobile photography at the time. But uh, if you have not played with Olympus gear, I, I would recommend that you go try it. You mentioned lynda.com. As, as you've done some Linda stuff, but beyond that, you've spoken or taught for Apple, right? You were one of the original yeah. T3 trainers on Aperture, NAB, Creative Live, you've done stuff for Macworld. The, the list goes on and on uh, uh, who you've done. And this one struck me. Again, research pays off. You were awarded the designation Signed Master with the Studio of Master in China. Yeah. Yeah, worldwide decorated photographer and people if you have not seen scott's photography i can't well i'll give you websites and they're popping up underneath them in fact you know what let's do it now what's your main portfolio website for your bird photography well scottborn.com points to a couple of different places where you can find better versions of my pictures i'm on instagram at born.scott uh, i kind of use that as a portfolio sometimes uh eaglephotographs.com is where the principal body of my eagle photography is that's what i'm famous for yeah the that's eagle photographs are just yeah. in and, and and seriously when you go these these are the best uh you know avian photography shots that you're gonna see in the world we're, we're talking world-class bird okay. photography that's, here that's nice of you but it's, and, you know, oh that's... man is it so true and it's accentuated <laughs> by the fact that i couldn't do this if i tried and had you sitting next to me but what you capture and today's shot is is just such a perfect example of this. And I'm curious when I bring this shot up, I've, I've got a number of questions on it. Okay. First of all, the name of this shot, as I bring it up here, I, I just want everybody to kind of gather this in if you're watching on video. And if you're listening to the audio feed, I'm going to try and describe it. I, I mention every show it's impossible, but this is this is a cardinal, by the way, right? Is a, is a northern cardinal male. Okay. A northern cardinal flying, he, he's about, he or she, I guess, uh, about on the right rule of third, flying to the left, wings in full spread. I mean, separation of the feathers. His head is not the way his body is. His head turned up sideways <laughs> to have perfect profile to the camera. And then you've got this silky soft bokeh in the background. I, I don't know how to describe this other than to say it's a once in a lifetime bird shot. Am I correct? This is one of those shots you fight for? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fortunate to have gotten this. I've been trying to get this shot for years. Uh, I, I mean, male cardinals don't hang out where I live in the Northwest up near Seattle. So I have to travel to see them. They're very, very, very common, pretty much everywhere midwest and east and people treat them like crows probably where you know uh, maybe in the in the midwest but for me they're special and and cardinals are one of the most beloved birds in the world they're the state bird of seven different states including my home state of indiana and uh, i went down to texas just four miles from the mexican border uh, to a place where there's uh, a guy's got a ranch and and we lease the space and set up blinds and and sit in a blind for literally eight hours a day for 12 straight days and just being in heaven because there's so many birds in the spring there 
And this, there was a bunch of cardinals and it's spring. So they're all busy because cardinals are very territorial. And the males, which are the bright red ones. the ones I was going to say, how do you know this is a male? It's the red color? Yeah, it's the red color. The female cardinals are, are almost gray with some red around them. But the males are, are in, in the bird world, birds, the, the males tend to be the most colorful because they attract prey away from the female, which gives the, the better chance for reproduction. So uh, the male uh, spread his wings and took off. And it's really, you know, a perfect example. If I'd had my can in there, I wouldn't have got the shot. This is one of those rare times where the gear, as much as my ornithological knowledge, had something to do with my success. You know, you know, I both know the old saying F8 and being there. I, I spend 300 days a year in the field, which is one of the reasons why I get a lot of these spectacular shots. You folks are at the mall. You're not going to get a cardinal shot. It's just as simple as that. But if you're in a blind willing to spend eight hours doing nothing but wait on this bird, it'll happen. But I got the shot because of a feature in Olympus's camera system called Pro Capture. Now, I don't particularly care for the name, but I'll tell you what it does I call it time travel photography because it is, when I try to explain it to people, they often think I'm making it up. In fact, I just came from Florida's Birding and Photo Festival where I was a speaker in St. Augustine, Florida, and I was giving a talk to my audience and they literally thought I was making this part up. But it's I'm funny because this was one of the questions actually I had for you later to ask you was about Pro Capture because I heard you mention it actually on a show you were on and there's a high and a low pro right. capture. And I'm like, what is pro capture? And I went and looked it up and it it's it's hard to describe, but I think of it, well, you describe it because you're going to be better at it. Yeah. I'm sorry to jump your question. Uh, no, that's awesome. You led right. It's perfect. <laughs> um, you know how security cameras r record on a loop, maybe 30 minutes, and then they record over themselves. Well, that's the same principle here, only it's a matter of seconds. And it's, you know, 15 frames or how many ever you set a second. Uh, I set mine at, at uh, 15 frames a second. And it when you press your finger on the shutter button halfway down, you start the buffer. And what it's doing is it's recording everything that's coming through the camera from the minute you press that button halfway down. But what happens when you commit to the full press, it goes back in time to a specific number of frames you've designated and starts and keeps all those pictures up to the moment you press the shutter button and then another group after. So basically mine's set up to record about 30 frames, 15 before, 15 after. And because Cardinal's reaction time when they leap up is so fast, no human can predictably press the shutter button in time to get that shot. So I simply said, <laughs> I hate to make this sound so unglamorous, but when you're in a blind for days and days and days and it's 100 degrees, you try to get comfortable. I'm sitting in a lawn chair in a blind. <laughs> I've got the the camera mounted on a fixed point where the perch is. I've got my focus manually because if you use autofocus and the bird moves forward or backwards, it's going to be hunting. And in that time it's hunting, it won't be sharp and you won't get the shot. So I pre-focused on the place where I know the bird's going to be. I wait till he leaps off the perch. I press the button. Well, my shutter press, you know, happens when my 65 year old brain sends the signal down to my 65 year old right. thumb. A little bit slower than what I wanted, but three or four frames before that, since I was on Pro Capture, this image that you see was there. And I got just the very moment of full wing, you know, spread and, and the primaries were all up there in, in their glory and there was nice light and everything came together. And it was literally, you know, like a thousandth of a second type of thing. And it was gone. And see, I've. Never seen it since. And that never right there, my friend, is the perfect reason why, th you know, I'm going to call them third party. They're not. I don't mean it in, in a derogatory way. Brands other than the top two are so important, right? Because the yeah. top two are not going to come out with a feature like that. They just don't feel they need to. Yeah, but it's, it's the companies like Olympus that are in a position where they can sit there and they can they can create tools for photographers like pro capture uh what what body was this the that picture was taken with the newest body the omd em1x and what lens 
Um, that's with the 300 F4 IS Pro lens. Okay, so which equivalent, which equ equivalent would be? 600. So, okay, so a 600 mm -hmm. lens. Wow. Any idea yeah. what the exposure was? I mean, like, what would you normally set exposure for like something like this? Well, to get the, here's the thing. To get the wings sharp like that, uh, and I, I allow for a tiny bit of motion because I think it's more dramatic, but you're around a four thousandth of a second is a middle. Whoa. And that was at um, ISO 3200. And um, uh, it was at F4, wide open. This is F4? Yeah. Because that, now I mean, seriously, people, you need to go look at the shot on the blog post or on Scott's site. This thing is beyond tack sharp. Right. I mean, this is literally the perfect bird shot. I mean, it, it it doesn't get better than this shot. Well, keep in mind, depth of field is relative to subject to camera distance. So as subject to camera distance decreases, so does depth of field. And conversely, as subject camera distance increases, so does depth of field. So F4 at the distance I was at was just fine to cover the area where the bird was going to be. And, you know, I do see on the forums, people say, oh, you can't get creamy bouquet out of a micro four thirds camera. Well, I'm sorry. I do it all the time. How far Maybe away they, would you have been? I was 21 feet. That's all? Yeah, 21 feet. Wow. Yeah, but and again. The focusing distance of that lens, Steve, because it's micro four thirds is seven and a half feet. With a, 600, uh, with a 300 lens. Yeah, with the equivalent field of view of a 600. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's it's pretty close, but it's it's not so close that the depth of field would be a thirtieth of an inch. So let let's get into something that I think you're the perfect one to answer, because you know I, I've heard uh, I think it was Rick Salmon said to me once talking about horse photography that you want to see all four hooves, and better yet, you want some of them off the ground type thing. When you're, and I made the comment, this is to me, at least, this is the perfect bird shot, right? I judge image competitions periodically. And if this one came up in front of me, I'd probably fall out of my chair. So my question to you is from your side, having done it for so long, what are the, what are the key elements that make a really great bird photograph? It's going to it's going to depress a lot of people because there's a lot of rules in bird photography. People say there's no rules in photography. They haven't been a bird photographer because there's a bunch of rules. People won't publish a shot unless it's perfect. And so you got to have the light directly behind you. That's rule number one. Um, you don't want the wind in your face because it's a simple fact that birds fly, perch and take off and land into the wind. So if the wind's in your face, that means you're going to get bird butt. So that's not going to be too helpful. I've never seen a bird butt catalog. If there was one, I could I could sell a lot of pictures. Okay. Um, you want to have all the standard compositional rules apply. You want good separation if there's multiple birds. Uh, you know, basically, it's just a matter of trying to get a shot that conveys a sense of place and motion and tells the bird story. There's a lot involved. Um, I've written a couple of posts about bird photography, basic tips over at picturemethods.com if everybody's interested. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of rules. And okay. it, it basically revolves around the sun. If you don't have, if you're not on sun angle, unless you're shooting a silhouette, you got to start over. Well, and that's where, again, when you see this picture, you'll understand what I mean. The, those of you that are listening as opposed to watching, because the light angle on this bird I can't imagine it working any other way, but that then brings in a question then. With so many rules in avian photography, along with all the standard rules, the composition rules, et cetera, I am kind of curious, what, what overlap is there between avian photography and other types of photography? I mean, to me, part of the reason I do this show is no matter who I'm talking to, if they're a wedding photographer, it can affect how I shoot concerts, right? If you're a portrait photographer, it can affect how somebody else shoots a landscape. There are certain overlaps in all genres. I'm curious what you can bring from other genres to help your bird photography. That's a really good question. And actually a lot because I've, you know, I'm 65 years old. I've been doing this since I was 14. I, I've done every kind of photography there is pretty much. A portrait photography, for instance, you can learn about pose. Head angle of a human is the same kind of head angle you want on a bird. 
Um, you want to have the eyes in focus in a human portrait. You want to have the eyes in focus in a bird. If they're, both eyes are showing, the eye that's closest to the camera should be in focus. Same rules. Um, you know, basically anything that would work in a lot of different kinds of photography in terms of composition can help a photograph if it's a bird photograph. There are a few unique rules to bird photography in that, you know, we can do pictures of one bird, two birds, or three birds, but from then on, it's got to be five, seven, nine, eleven, no even numbers. You can't have the wings in a certain position. They can't be pancake very often. They have to be, you know, wide open, up or down. Um, you can't have any overlap. If there's multiple birds, they can't be touching. Uh, it, it, people, you know, when you first start this, Steve, you get a picture and there's a bird in the picture and you're excited, like, oh my God, I got a bird picture. But it then, <laughs> it then moves from that's not really going to work. You've got to have perfect light and a perfect pose and everything has to work. You referenced my exhibition in China. I just came off an exhibition in China and I, you know, it, it was amazing to see. I, I, lots of video was taken of the exhibition and people were looking at the eagle shots and trying to figure out how I got them. Well, that's 25 years of making those pictures <laughs> and waiting for perfect light and perfect wind. And right. You know, you're not seeing the ones where I was out there for a week and nothing happened because, well, the wind sucked or the light. Well, never it's, came it's out the patience. And I think you were the That's first one I ever heard tell me or say to me or say on a podcast, I forget where it was, but I'm pretty sure it was you. And that is, uh, and it might have been your cranes in the fire miss shot that you were talking about. And that is the fact that you go to a place and shoot what you think is a perfect shot doesn't mean and, and don't get it doesn't mean the place is bad, doesn't mean you were bad. It just to get everything to line up. Bird photography is patience. Yeah, one of the things that I miss about portrait photography is that generally people show up at the appointed time, stand where you <laughs> tell them to, the light's perfect, you don't have to worry about the wind. There's so much going for you. But when you're dealing with wild creatures, um, I have no no possibility of influencing what they're going to do. It's I'm there at, at, you know, their leisure and I show up prepared. That's the best I can do. And then I've got to hope for circumstances that are way beyond my control to align for me to get the shot that I want. And I'm cursed, Steve, with this thing called pre-visualization. I see pictures of birds in my mind and then I spend three, 10, 13 years trying to make them. Because once I see it in my mind, it imprints. Cranes in the Fire Miss is perhaps one of my most best-known photographs. That was 13 years of going to the same place on the same day every year for 13 years in a row to wait for everything to align. And, you know, when it didn't work, I just kept going back and kept going back and kept going back. And eventually I got it. You've got shots. This one being a bird in flight uh, is just so, again, this this in any genre of photography, you couldn't pose a human this perfectly if you tried. And you definitely can't pose a bird this perfectly. The, the timing, again, his head, this is what <laughs> killed me. The first time I saw this shot, right? The way his wings are, his beak should be facing away from you in theory, right? What your, what your mind would picture. His head turns to get his eye as a perfect profile. But you have shots that I love. Uh, one time when you were living in Vegas, I went into your studio and you were showing me around and I was looking at some of your shots. And most of these that I'm going to mention are on on uh, Instagram. You have a snowy egret called Bad Hair Day that's yeah. freaking awesome. <laughs> You've you. also got some crazy artistic stuff. You have this artistic one of these legs, I'm guessing a crane or something, in the water and the reflection, but all you really see is the legs. Yeah, that, that's a black and white that I did at Little Astero Lagoon in Fort Myers Beach, Florida. I used to have a condo down there and I go in, in the springtime before they dredged the lagoon to build more condos. And uh, I was thinking, you know, I have a million of these egret shots. What can I do differently? So I started doing some artistic studies and trying to emulate paintings. And this is basically to your point a minute ago about how do you use other genres of photography to inform what you do. I use other art forms to inform what I do. So I spent a lot of time, believe it or not, in museums looking at paintings and sculpture. I mean, I probably spend way more time than I should looking at paintings and sculpture and all. There was a painting by Degas once that informed uh, 
the way I wanted to approach getting bird and flight shots. So I started looking for a certain pose in birds because of that painting. And, you know, if you're looking for something, it's, right. called, it's called schema. If you're looking for something, you'll find it. It's like if you decide I want to buy a new car and you're interested in Ford trucks, all of a sudden you'll see nothing but Ford trucks on the road. You're like, wow, everybody's got a Ford truck. They were always there. You just weren't looking for them. So right. I use other art forms to inform what I do. And then I go about trying to do it. You know, And I feel like if you get one cranes in the fire mist in your lifetime, you're lucky. I've gotten 20 or 30 of them. So I feel very fortunate to have this job, to get paid for it, to get to speak on behalf of the birds, uh, to be an ambassador for them and for Olympus, of whom I'm very proud to be their ambassador as well, because they're wonderful people who do everything in their power to try and prove photography. And there's lots of good cameras. The good news is these days, it's not like the days of my FTN and the 200 Nikon lens. Every camera and lens is pretty good these days. There's no really bad stuff. Yeah, I mean, if but, you own a camera, you have the capability of taking yeah. a very nice picture. But yeah, it's, it's just it, for, for me, the Olympus stuff, because I can get a long focal length without a heavy lens. And because I can get access to technologies like and crazy image stabilization. I can shoot 840 millimeters at 1 40th of a second handheld, which is unheard of. And I can use this pro capture mode. These kinds of things have really empowered me. And, you know, there are a few trade offs with going with micro four thirds, but I found that the benefits not only made up for them, but way surpassed them. And last year, I had the record number of images under license in my career. And, you know, as an old man, you start to think, well, maybe I'm going to peter out here. And, and oh, I, I'm at the best. I've, I'm the best I've ever been. And I'm, well, I'm excited. Those technologies, and in your case, the, the weight of the camera, the ability to have such long focal length in a lighter camera, the, I'm sorry, but the pro capture mode is, I want so bad. I want. It's insane. I want it's that insane. thing. In concerts, that would freaking be awesome. Oh, yeah. To, to have stuff like that, it still comes down to the artist, right? The gear empowers you, but it's the artist, the vision, the, the the training, the technique, the knowledge. And what you do with reflections, you have another reflection, what I love, which is the two egrets that are reflected in the water. And then one of my favorite, it's a black and white with, I don't know what kind of bird it is, but his head is kind of under his wing. Yeah, that's actually the rarest bird I've ever photographed. That's a reddish egret, white phase morph, meaning, it is a morph, meaning it's not the usual appearance of the bird. That bird is called a reddish egret because it's usually red. But in that case, there's an albino version of that bird. And there are only 1,400 reddish egrets left in the world. And of them, uh, you know, less than 1% are white phase morphs. And I found that one at Fort Myers Beach. I was looking for him for 10 years. I found him and he imprinted on me. <laughs> which birds are prone to do. So it was one of those things where the first seconds I saw him, I did the, you know, all the motor drives on high. You know, I'm gonna, I'm, I am can't believe I found this bird. I come down out of the condo that afternoon. He's standing by the elevator. He's like, where you been? And he followed me around for 10 days. He was photobombing my other shots. And I was like, okay, reddish eager, white phase morph, go home now. I got enough pictures of you. <laughs> You're really... You're, I understand you're rare, but you're kind of milking it now. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was actually taken it right at, as it went dark. And I photographed him with a flash while he was preening there in the shallow lagoon. And that picture's on my business card. I, I'm pretty proud of that shot. There's, there's something I've always wondered about bird photography. And you posted a kind of behind the scenes thing, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And that is using artificial light with bird photography and and you had a behind the scenes thing where where you had some flashes yeah. set up for hummingbirds okay so that was my question actually is what makes you decide actually this is going to be like 14 questions in one because <laughs> i'm i'm freaking out here in my head trying to come up with them all what makes you decide when you're when you're sitting there waiting to shoot or you're planning your sh shoot based on the environment that's around you. What's the trigger to say, I need to add artificial light to this bird shoot? And if you're going to, are there specific modifiers that you use? Do you tend to go bare bulb? I mean, is it just a Stofan attachment? You understand what I'm saying? 
Sure. I don't use a lot of flash, not because I'm against it, just that I, I find good light. I, I chuckle a little bit because today, if you go on any camera form, Steve, and someone, I don't care who the company is, introduces a new camera, I'm willing to bet my right kidney, which by the way, is the only one I got left, that the, you know, 90% of the first hundred questions are going to be, what's a slow light performance? And <laughs> I don't understand that being an old man because I've chased light my whole career. Photography is literally about light. Look up the roots of the word. I don't care what it's low light performance is because I'm looking for light. And if I can't find it, guess what? I'll make it. It's not a big deal. So with hummingbird photography, though, the reason I use flashes is it's the only way to freeze the wings in action. So you simply can't get a shutter speed of high enough duration with decent light to really freeze everything. So because the flash duration is so, sh so short, I'll use flashes that will freeze the hummingbird's wings. And I'll use four flashes for that, one on the background and then one directly on the bird and two on either side to try to make the light somewhat flat because that's what sells in bird photography. And um, what I do is I, I basically just use very low power and I don't use any kind of light modifiers at all. All the same power? I mean, you're not doing uh, ratios or anything, uh, right? Well, yeah, the, the ratio is a little bit different in the um, in that the, the, the light that's on the, the background has to be pretty hot because that's to beat any shadows that might be cast from overhead trees or so whatever. So a separation so thing, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's what that one's for. And then... The other three, uh, the, there's, you know, it depends on the shoot and what I'm working with, what species I'm photographing, but generally they're in the neighborhood of the same. And they're all, uh, they've all in the past, I've done this off PC cords because I'm an old man and I'm old fashioned and that's what I know how to do. But thankfully, Olympus just came out with radio controls now uh, to be able to do all this. So my next Hummingbird shoot, I'll be using all the new Olympus gear so that I can uh, simply do it all electronically and not have to worry about it. You know, th this shot, again, it comes back to composition, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that when you, when you make a shot, the old, if you want to break rules, fine, but there's a reason all of these composition rules exist, right? They're pleasing to the eye. The, the general viewer tends to like certain things. The angle of the bird here, that it's not straight across, right? He's going probably, you know, 10 o'clock, let's call it, from, from tail to nose. Going towards 10 o'clock, he's got plenty of room in front of him for nose room. I don't know what the crop is on this, but it looks maybe like an eight by 10. Uh, it just compositionally, this works so well. I'm curious when you get back from a shoot, what software do you normally use? Well, not big surprise here. I use Luminar. Uh, I use Luminar 2018, Luminar Flex, and Luminar 3 in some combination, depending on what I'm doing. And uh, I don't very rarely, maybe 3% of the time I use Photoshop if there's something that's very harshly lit or whatever that requires a lot of very sophisticated masking. It's a little easier to do in Photoshop. But almost everything I do is in Luminar. And I'm not a big... Surprisingly enough, some people hearing this will know that I used to be president of Luminar and to have been a president of uh, president, excuse me, of Skyland, which makes Luminar, and to have been president of a photography software company for this next statement to be what it is is shock slopey. But I don't really like to spend a lot of time in post. For me, fifteen, maybe thirty seconds is an eternity in post. I don't get paid for that. I get paid to press the shutter button. I'd rather be out in the field. I have a saying: I'd rather press this button pointing to a camera than that button pointing to a mouse. So I usually set some presets up in Luminar that I like because my work is fairly consistent. I get very good exposures in the field. I know what I'm doing. I bring the same kind of work. I got maybe three presets I use most of the time. I can hit that thing, maybe an extra juicer here or there on something, but you know, 15 seconds and I'm done. You're saying you, you wouldn't have even spent five minutes on a shot like this? The Cardinal shot? Yeah. That's 30 seconds. Wow. Really? Just use my preset. That's it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> see, just start this is what I need to fix because well, I spend way too much time and I'm like you. I know people who, who uh, just will spend hours in Photoshop or Lightroom and detailing an image and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you know what? I shot it. I'm already bored. I want to go do another shoot. 
Right. Well, you know, Henry Cartier-Bresson said it's, you know, it's that moment that he cares about. He didn't, he didn't really care about looking at prints of his work that was way past. He's like, he wanted to capture the defining moment. For me, it's like, again, I, I'm, this is my job. I get paid for this. So I, I wish it were a hobby. I admire people that can have it as a hobby. I, I think they're lucky. But as a job, I want to get paid. So I don't get paid to sit in front of the computer. And, and I'm, you know, there was a time when I was pretty good at post-processing. Back when Aperture came out, I was an Aperture guru. I was the, one of the first class of T3 certified Aperture trainers. T3 means train the trainer. I was good enough to not only train people how to use it, but to train people on how to train them to use it. Right. Derek, Derek Story and I gave the world's first Aperture class at Macworld days after the product launched when we had a 43-page PDF manual to work with and had to pigeonhole the product manager to ask him a couple of questions because nobody knew how to do it. Uh, I was, I knew everything that you could do with Aperture and I was really good at it. And there was a time, Photoshop 1 or 2, I actually wrote one of the first books on Photoshop for photographers. But like any time after that, I'm far from a guru these days. And I don't care to be, I fortunately have gotten to the point in my life where I can employ those gurus if I need them. But I, I basically work the same way, Steve. You know, people don't understand what the word professional photographer means in my experience. They think it has something to do with money, and it doesn't. It has to do with proficiency. A professional photographer can generate proficient results, predictable results on a consistent basis. So my work is consistent. I don't change anything. I do what I do because it's consistently acceptable in front of the publishing community, which is all I care about because that's who writes the checks. Beauty's in the eye of the checkbook holder, I say. Uh, I, I shoot for those guys. And I shoot, I, I know when a picture is well exposed. I've been at this a while. I know when a picture is well lit. I know when a picture has good composition. If those situations come together, then I come in and run one of my presets, export it, send it out and try to sell it. It's pretty simple. So if I, I do know people who do birding, and bird photography. And some of them are good. Some of them are better than others. And most of them are inconsistent at best. So I'm kind of curious, as long as you've been doing it and as, as successful as you are at it, if somebody wanted to get better at their bird photography, right? If they wanted, there's no shortcuts, understand. But if there was one thing that the average person could do to get better at bird photography, what would it be? Well, it would be to make sure that the, this, they're on sun angle. That's the principal problem I see. People send me bird photos to critique all the time, and they're just excited because they have a bird in the frame. They don't understand that in the real world it has to be a perfectly lit bird, and that starts by being what we call on sun angle. Another way to think of this, Steve, is to point your shadow at the bird. If the sun is off to the left or to the right, and you're photographing the bird, you're in the wrong place. Side lighting is wonderful for landscape and architectural photography. It really makes the texture pop. But it's horrible for bird photography because it creates, creates all kinds of nasty shadows. The bird's beak, wing, feathers, whatever, creates shadows against its body that are very unsightly. So publishers won't run those shots. The only shots they'll run are front lit or completely back lit or silhouette. That's it. Those are your three choices. Which is interesting because looking at this shot, right? Theoretically, you'd call this flat light, right? I mean, it's, it's, we but love flat because light. birds have so much contrast and natural color in them, right? There is a feeling of light and shadow in this bird that gives the depth. I mean, the feeling of the space between the feathers, dude, this is just, this is, this well, is see, to brilliant. Make feathers, to make those feathers stand out and to get the true incredible colors that many birds have in their feathers. You need a lot of light. You need to have a front lit subject. And birds have thousands and thousands of flat feathers, with the exception, by the way, of hummingbirds, who have the fewest feathers of any bird in the world. But most birds have thousands of feathers, and they do have their own texture. And you're right, you, you shoot them flat, and you still sort of feel like there's something to them. But a well-lit bird, the iridescence of their feathers, it's... It's totally okay that it's flat light. Now, people that come to this that are used to doing other kinds of photography like, but geez, that's, that's flat light. I'm like, yes, be thankful for it. That's what we want. We right. want flat light. We want the sun behind us. And guess what? That sun moves. So if you've been in the same place as a bird photographer, here's another tip, for three hours, you, you're in the wrong place. 
because in the three hour time that you were there, the sun is in a different location. Now you need to stay on sun angle. And I don't care if there's a, a, a bald eagle landing the space shuttle at your high school football field and Madonna's on the tail and George Bush is in the pilot seat. If that isn't on sun angle, I'm not photographing it. <laughs> so it's, it's if people simple. want to see which they should, more of Scott Bourne's work. We talked about scottbourne.com. Yep. And that links to your portfolio and also your, the workshops that you do. And you do a number of different workshops that people should look into. Well, you got any yeah. coming up? There, I have, I think all my 2019 seats are sold, but I have some 2020 stuff. But you can find that at picturemethods.com on the workshops tab. But uh, go to Go to Scott Bourne on Facebook, Scott Bourne on Twitter, Scott Bourne on Flickr. I really like Flickr now because Smug Mug Bottom and you don't have to use that dreaded Yahoo login. And the, the, they don't crunch their pictures like Facebook does. So you can actually, if you want to see my work the way I intended you to see it, look at the pictures on Facebook. Because, I mean, don't look at the pictures on Facebook. Look at the pictures on Flickr. Because Facebook's use a compression algorithm that crunches them. So does Instagram. Yeah, it makes them look so horrible. But if you take the same picture and look at it on Facebook and then look at it on Flickr, on Flickr, it looks great. And then I do something that very few people do, Steve. You know, I print and see me at Photo Plus Expo or one of the big shows where I'm speaking. I always have a printed portfolio with me, and that's the best representation of my work. And Olympus, of course, is kind to me. They print very large very large prints of my work and put it on the booths when we do the shows in New York. They had two nine foot wide prints of mine at the top of the booth at the very back. And they had about five or six 48 inch prints all at eye level, no rope in front of them. People say you can't print, print big from micro four thirds, but you can. Yeah. Um, I, I like to show my prints and I like to show them big. That's the best representation of my work. And I, you know, do get published in lots of books and magazines. Those prints uh, in those periodicals and in the books, that's what I want you to see. But the best representation online is probably at Flickr. And I'm just there at flickr.com slash Scott Bourne. So uh, you're actually Scott Bourne on Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and LinkedIn. Uh, Instagram's the unique one. It's Bourne.Scott. Yeah, for some reason, I can't get my own name there. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? Uh, yeah. Eagle Photography is eaglephotographs.com. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Scottborn.com. And again, the podcast. If you have not listened to this podcast already, I was episode three. Uh, but then you have real people on. Like you've got Rick Salmon is on episode four. I'm not going to tease who's on episode five, but he's got a great guest on episode five that will be up by the time this show goes out. Check out picturemethods.com and don't just go to the website and listen to an episode, which you can listen to it on there. Subscribe in your podcast app yeah, to his as well. Do that. Please do that for both Steve and I. If you subscribe on iTunes, whether or not you listen on iTunes, it really helps with discovery. And then, you know, I've got links to all the various podcast players in the world on my site. You can feel free to use any of them. But if you subscribe in iTunes, it makes it a little easier for people to find us and know that we're out there. And I, you know, I've been, I'm on a lot of photography podcasts. I co-founded TWIP, This Week in Photo, which you kind of know a little bit about. Uh, With Alex I Lindsay. Was, me, Alex Lindsay, and Steve Simon were the first, did the first episode live at Macworld, by the way. And uh, your first that. episode was live at Macworld? Yeah. And Steve Simon was there. He's a well known photojournalist and does lots of uh, political photography, does lots of photographs of political candidates, presidents, et cetera. And he's, he's a top notch photojournalist. And he was there and he's a friend of ours. And we grabbed him and said, Steve, we're going to do a podcast. And he just followed us because he's a friend. And he goes, what's a podcast? <laughs> and so he was on the very first episode of TWIP. So I did that. And then I founded photofocus.com, which I ran for 15 years or so now. My friend Rich Harrington runs that. Then I started uh, PPN, uh, Photography Podcast Network with Marco LaRusse. But then I got sidetracked because Skylum hired me to be president of the company. So I Marco's had doing a good job that. with that. I was on Marco's podcast, actually. Nice guy. Yeah, Marco's, Marco's a tremendous street photographer and a great guy. And so now I'm, I was like, well, I'm semi-retired for the sixth time. Maybe I'll start another podcast and see if people will tolerate it. And so far, it's pretty good. We're in 61 countries already. We've got roughly 30,000 listeners. I'm, I'm grateful, very much grateful for uh, the fact that people still want to hear what I have to say after all these years. And it does go all the way back to the days of TWIP and TWIT and 
Leo and I and, and Alex and, and Andy on Mac Break Weekly, I did 153 episodes of that show. And I'm occasionally on Leo's network. I'm on the screensavers a couple of times a year. So you can check me out on. Oh, I got to watch that. Uh, Andy, I've met Andy a few times. Uh, and so I, I, you know, know him a little bit. A super wonderful guy. I've met Leo once because I was up there for the launch for Mac Break Weekly of, of one of the phones. And I've never actually met Alex, but I follow him on online. Just a brilliant guy. Gr- great group of people. If you're into tech, you should check out Leo Laporte's network. And Mac Break Weekly is, is one of my favorite podcasts. Scott Bourne. To say that this is an honor is such an understatement, man. First of all, you don't normally do video, and you were willing to do this show with me, and I can't thank you enough. Let's be clear. I don't ever do video, and here's why. I hope that you got the email with the the disclaimer you have to send out. Any women of childbearing age, if they watch this video, it could ruin them for life. I mean, I have a face built for radio, dude. I'm like you. I'm an old radio guy. So I don't do video, but for you, I did it. This will probably be the only video podcast I ever appear on unless it's Twit. Well, I again, I can't say thank you enough. It's an honor to have you here. Everybody check him out. I gave you all those stuff. But keep in mind that you can find all the links to Scott's websites, his podcast, uh, Picture Methods podcast. All of those links are on the blog post associated with this episode. You can find the blog post at behindtheshot.tv. And while you're there, you can browse the back catalog of all the other information. You can find all my contact information. It, my website is stevebrazel.com. The website for the podcast is uh, behindtheshot.tv. If you want to hit me up on social media, Facebook, it's Steve Brazel Photography or Behind the Shot Podcast. If you want to uh, do the podcast one on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are both the same. It's just at Steve Brazel or at Behind the Shot TV. Reach out to me. I try and answer everybody. Make sure that you head by whatever your podcast app of choice is and make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. We are also on YouTube if you prefer, but whatever it is, subscribe, hit the bell, do whatever you can and drop us a review. It would be much appreciated. As always, this is the Behind the Shot podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you on the next show. 